What's up, what's up? It's time for Done Way Past Funny. With your host, G.D. Fenderson. Join us as we take a look back at the early works of seasoned comedians before they were seasoned with this week's guest, Christy Bellage. It's time to get down and get dope with Done Way Past Funny. Hi, I'm G.D. Fenderson, certified forensic humorist and host of Done Way Past Funny. Thank you for joining us as we continue our interview with the headlining feminist, Christy Bellish. Enjoy. Call me, sir. <laughs> now, you gotta res- G.D. Fenderson, you gotta respect this man. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I want to bring up the, I guess the first three minutes of, uh, you have a thing in, at QED? Oh, uh, we don't need to look at that. That that doesn't need to be looked at. It's awful. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, or, or, or I could just. Because oh, we don't have to, but if you want to, we can. But I'm gonna pass on that one. Okay, all right. <laughs> the kill yeah. one is enough. I think that's. Uh, I think that 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 was a moment in life where I questioned every moment I've ever done on stage and whether or not I deserve to even be on stage. I think that's good. <laughs> well, it's funny. well, I just, I do want to bring one thing. You, One of the things that you mentioned, there was about the, the ganja group that watches when they think that Obama's a lizard person. Oh and, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And so one of the questions I was going to mention is that because you mentioned about uh, and what if the you know that turns out that they were real, the lizard mm-hmm. people, and they expose themselves at a UN event and say, hey, look, here we go. We're real. We're lizard people. And, and my media thought was so real. That would explain the deliberate destruction yeah. of a and global warming because they they need the, you know, they don't generate their own body heat. And so they would like a warmer climate if they were yeah, really they in charge. And, no. and then their leader is Mitch McConnell, the lizard of all lizards. <laughs> See, and I, I think, of, yeah, well, he's, <laughs> he is so good at the evil he does. <laughs> yes, he is. I mean, I... I used to watch him work on the Senate. I'm not from the Senate floor, but on tele- on C-SPAN. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, the Democrats need somebody like him. I mean, the closest thing they had was Harry Reid. But Harry Reid knew, Harry, how should I put Mitch McConnell's knowledge, his, his academic knowledge of how the Senate worked was like far, far beyond average mortal. And I think Harry Reid was like the closest thing to that on the left. But Harry Reid had like morals. And he was like, yeah, I know what to do, but I won't do that because that's immoral. And Mitch McConnell was like, morals? No, power. (laughs) Power. Control. Power, control. And Harry Reid is like, you know, Mitch, what you're doing is wrong. And the only way I can stop you is to put a bullet in you, but that would be wrong. You know, so, and Mitch McConnell would be like, I would think twice about putting a bullet in you, Harry. <laughs> and we're friends. You know, so, and, and but Mitch McConnell is so, so good at his at being evil. And it's I admire his knowledge. I admire his knowledge, but God is he evil. And I don't use that term lightly, but if you knew, if people knew the things that he actually stood for and the things he did to get those things done, you, there's no other way to say it. He's evil. He's evil. He's evil. All right. You may disagree. But no, I think all these motherfuckers, I mean, I were like, I, in the Kill Tony side, I used to be an intern. I was an intern twice there. I was an intern for 
the Senate secretary, and then for Barbara Mikulski when she was still in office. And I crashed so many committee hearings because I had, they give you like a intern tag. You can go into any of the hearings and when you're an intern, like you have your assignments, but you can just ask like, hey, I'm going to go to the floor or I'm going to go here, here and here. And the restrictions weren't as bad back then. And I don't think people realize like all of that is underground. There's underground like trains in the Senate. Right. Yes. That you, you can go. Um, so I used to just get on the train all the time. There's like an actual subway. And this was before Obama was in office. This is before, you know, um, McCain was still in office. He was still alive. You know, I, I shared elevators with all these guys. And, you know, I just knew just to be quiet and to smile and to keep it moving. And nobody would nobody would kick me out of Senate here, like Senate committee hearings. Obviously, they had private hearings, but you know, this most recent one with the military spending is wild. Like, I don't know if you saw the video with Diane Feinstein where literally yeah. her her staffer whispers in her ear to just say I. And you're just like, what is going on here? What is going on? We have a lot, you know. Yeah. And I mean, this dates back to how old I am, but Robert Byrd was still in office when I was an intern. Yeah. That motherfucker wow. was still in office. He was still alive. He was like, you want to talk about an old turtle? That guy was a fucking 200 year old tortoise. Yeah, he yeah. he he helped the founding fathers. He was the one who just kept saying, "No, leave slavery in for now." He was back then. So, Bird was. He was West Virginia, like freaking oh. <laughs> now, let's see here. But how many states do you think you've been in? My, I have a bucket list. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't ever think I'll be famous. So I just have like things I would like to accomplish in comedy. And one of those things is I want to do comedy in all 50 states. Um, and I'm, I've, I, I'm far, far from that. I'm below half. I'm like 15 states. I've performed in 15 states, you know, and I just would like to do more. I want to do the other 35, but you know, how many states do you think you've done comedy in? I think I've done comedy in not a counting lot poverty, of... not counting <laughs> the state of poverty, and not counting the state of homelessness. So if you leave those two out. <laughs> well, I've been through most of them. I haven't been to Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, like that area. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't been to the Dakotas or Montana or Alaska or Hawaii. So those are the states I want to go to. I've traveled through a lot of them. I think I've, I want to say confidently, confidently like 25 probably. Okay. That and I've done Stanford and traveled through pretty much most of them. West Coast, East Coast, Southwest, you know, mid, mid state west, Midwest. Now, is there a, a place or a state or something that you think got you better, understands Christy better as a comedian than the other places? Like you could, if when you were on stage, there's, wait a second, these people get me. Is, you know, do you have that? Arizona. I think oh. Arizona is really, really, um, actually quite a progressive place for comedy. I think it's very um, awesome. I think um, Des Moines is an amazing place for comedy. There's just these little pockets that people don't know about. Evanston, Wyoming, I had one of the best shows I've ever had in my life in a Nights Inn hotel bar. And the crowd was so diverse and from all walks of life, from farmers to, you know, very progressive couples um, who were like swingers, I think. Um, I did not partake, but that's what I think was going on. And like, there was just, it's funny on the road what you'll find, like these small towns. Honestly, GD, I think Benny's is one of the best places to go because you never know what that room's going to be. You know, you could have a room one night that's full of like every walk of life. 
and you're just there in this bar in Maryland. Like I like these bar bars that you don't know what you're going to find, you know, but I think um, as a whole, I think comedy in Arizona, Phoenix, Tucson in between are great. All, all walks of life, all age groups. Um, and obviously like I have a soft spot for Los Angeles cause I just, I really love LA. I really do. Um, and for comics coming up, I think Austin is a great place to go because you can get on stage everywhere in that town and not just even in Austin, but in the towns around Austin as well. Now, my understanding, because I, I have not, I have not performed. Now, I've been in, I have been to 48 of the 50 states. I've never been to Alaska or Hawaii, but I've only performed comedy in 15 of them. So I've been to Austin, I've been to Texas, um, but not as a comedian. Now, my understanding of the, like the Austin scene is there's like a lot of comedians and a lot of venues there, like within walking distance. Like so you, you could, there's like do, dozens and dozens of places that you could do comedy outdoor, maybe, but the comedy and it's like, well, three minute spots, but there, there were 35 comedians, three minute spots, but then you can go down the road to another spot, you know? Yeah. But yeah. how does that work for you, though? Because you don't you're not like a three minute comedian. You're you know, you're long form, you know, and and I think you're actually I think you're I I you're one of the few people that if you take, you know, 30, 45 seconds or a minute even to set something up that it's to me, it's worth the trip to get to the end of what you're trying to say. You know, you're one of those people that I think is worth the wait. You know, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm missing something up. Up down a solid foundation, and and once the foundation is laid down, I think you just take people on a nice little ride, and it's like, okay, now now that you know what, now that I've educated you into this, now let's have some fun with it. You know, and I think you're worth, I think you're worth that that wait, but that's not something that works well. That it's hard to explain that to a booker. You know, they have to be willing to. You know, a lot of the reason why I'm saying is because, probably like, if you're doing a three minute thing, I don't mm -hmm. think they're getting a good representation of what you can do. You know, and do you do you think does it damage you to have to modify what you do for a three minute set, or do you think? Um, uh, I'm just I'm just trying to figure that out because being long form myself. I find it damaging to me in the long term, you know, because my natural state is long term, you know, long form. That's my natural way of doing comedy. And when I do too much short form, I find myself almost like uh, an elephant being chained to a post. And then you take the chain off and the elephant forgets that he can walk further. <laughs> you no, know, I don't know how it would affect you. That's all. I, it just took me 10 minutes to ask you a 30 second question. So how does that affect you? <laughs> no, it, I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. Um, New York is generally three to five minute mics. So that's what I came up in. Um, Austin is generally four to five minute mics. And then LA is generally three minute club mics. So if you're doing something like the comedy store, or the Hollywood Improv, those are three minutes. And then the Laugh Factory is two minutes clean. And then you graduate up and up and up if you get graduated. So I had to teach myself and I have to adjust. And Kill Tony was 60 seconds. So, right. you know, how, and, and, and the thing with Kill Tony is how do, when I was approaching Kill Tony, it was like, how do you take a rant and put it into 60 seconds? Well, bitch, you're going to make it work. And I just did the same thing I do on stage is like, I don't know if this is 60 seconds. I just know when they play the cat that I need to wrap up and I just got to trust my glitter. I got to trust my gut that this um, gets through. Um, so a lot of it is trust, trust the timing, trust the music, trust the fact that like, you know, if you listen to a three minute song, and can get your bit within a three minute song, you're good to go. I practice in the mirror. I um, trust that, you know, every weird thing that I do has a purpose. 
you know, a lot of this is trusting the unknown. And when you're doing a three minute at like the improv, you've got a fucking booker in the back who's booking for the improv. You've got to fucking wrap the shit up. So like, and you don't know if you're going on stage at a place like the improv, you know, you're sitting in a room of a bunch of comics who are eager and hungry to get up there. And you're like, damn, does my horse cock rant? <laughs> Is it going to get within this three minutes? And so the way I approach something like that, where I know I have three minutes, I just go, usually before that, I go, what am I going to do? What am I going to do on stage? Right up until my name is called. When I get on stage, I go horse cock. And then I just keep talking about horse cock until I see the light. And then when the light happens, then I start time, then I start feeling the time in my body. And then I descend out. So that's how I approach shit like that, where it's like, A, I have to respect the comics here. B, I need to respect the light. And C, I need to respect all this venue and its history. So that's really how I approach stuff like that. I don't run the light. If I do run the light, I apologize for it because that's my fucking fault and I should have done better. Now, I try really hard not to run the light. Uh, and I try not to take advantage of like there's some people some hosts that would let me run the light you know because they know me or they're friends with me and i still and i don't like to run the light with them either i want to respect the light for them and for the other comics as much as you know so i understand what you're saying but i shouldn't say but because that sounds different now however no and that just means but i'm familiar with the the horse cock routine at least part of it you know, because when I saw it, you were dusting it off because it was like you hadn't done it for a while or you'd written it. And maybe had you hit. I, but I this when I saw it. Like I said, there's not a lot of like joke jokes in there, but your detail, your attention to detail and the way you describe things is what makes it funny, you know, and so. And people wind up laughing at things that aren't necessarily. You know, if they were watching it on TV, if they were watching Dr. Pimple Popper, they'd be going, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, Dr. But, Pimple Popper. yeah, I said, but they would. So if you were doing your joke as, as Dr. Pimple Popper with the TV, people would be like, ah, oh, my God, oh, I can't watch it. <laughs> I can't watch it. But the way you do it on stage where you do it, it can't. It's more like, wow, I can't take my eyes off her hands. <laughs> you know, and it's funny, you know, and it's just to me, it's just funny how you can take that same, that same routine, the horse cop, and it could be so disgusting, or, or it could be really, really funny. But basically, it's like you, as you put it, it's, but basically, it's real, you know, and that's so it doesn't matter. So it's, it's, it's no, this is just real. If you want to be disgusted by it, fine. If you want to be, you know, if you want to find a joke in it, great. But this is real, and and that's one of the things I like about what you do is is it's real. It's real first, and then you try to find or hope, you know, usually you find the real funny in the midst of it. You know, so I so when I watch you, I find it reassuring oh. for what I do. <laughs> you know, um, and actually, I think you're a lot braver than I am, a hell of a lot braver than I am because. I, I, I watch you and you, sometimes you pour your heart and soul into something. And that's what I was wondering about when you go on your rants, how do you get it back? But, you know, cause I'm, I didn't know if there was like a device that you have, like all of a sudden, like, cause when I go on a rant, I don't know how to get it back. I honestly don't. I, I, I become aware that I'm having a rant and then I just stop. And then I just said, what was I trying to say? <laughs> you know? What was I trying to say before I went on that rant? Where was I? You know, and and but so I do. I I I'm actually afraid to let loose like you let loose. You go. I mean, when you're, I think you're. Like I said, you're. I think you're like ten times braver than any of the quote male patriarchal comics that I've watched because mm -hmm. you you do you let it out there. You live it. You 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 let. You give the audience a dose of reality, and if but if they stick in with it, I think they get a dose of hilarity as well. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah. That means a lot. No, now I I don't know how what else, and you sure you don't want to watch that other clip? I'm just teasing. I, I I'm just teasing. I I'm really... so I don't want to torture people. <laughs> I feel like I've tortured people enough with the Kill Tony clip. Well, see, and I don't. The, hopefully, what people do is what is that they get to see part of the the the, the making of the comedy because not all of us are the same. No, even though we do, we're the, the title, like so I don't, I still don't like calling myself a comedian. I I, I am a humorist, and mm -hmm. there is a big difference between a humorist and a comedian. And, and for anyone who doesn't know the difference, they could watch like um, Will Rogers, you know, or or you know, I'm trying to think uh, George Carlin, as opposed to like Rodney Dangerfield, mm -hmm. you no. Know, big difference you know yeah. and well even like bill hicks to carlin yeah no now my now my do you have like a because I, I watch what comedy is becoming with with the um what are they calling it political correctness I mm -hmm. watch what comedy is becoming, and I haven't been doing it that long that it, that I would, but I've been watching it so long that I've, I'm seeing the difference of how people, you know, and comedians are losing their edge. And one of the things that we used to be able to do was to make s social commentary palatable for the world, and now it's almost like with the PC era, we're not even allowed to discuss social commentary because they don't want it to be palatable they don't even want it discussed um are you afraid of things getting too too pc for you or um i i mean this goes back to home when you're talking about home is i've never really felt like i've had a home like people have home clubs home stages this is why I go on the road because it gives me freedom. And I, I'm just kind of realizing this now because I've been like putting together this little vlog of all my road experiences and my travels. And as I go through the old videos, I'm like, oh, wow. Like it's almost like because I don't feel like I fit in and like you were saying you call yourself a humorist. I don't know if I'm a comedian. I don't know what I am. There's a comedian called, uh, or his name was Brody Stevens. He passed away, but he used to say he does comedy. Right. Like he, he's not a comedian. He does comedy. And I kind of look at it that way. This is a gift and I'm trying to figure out where my place is. I think that's why I'm in Maryland right now is because I feel I, I, I don't know where I fit in. You know, I've, I've had bookers tell me I'm too raunchy. Um, I've had bookers tell me I'm too, I had somebody in LA, you know, tell me, you know, they tell you what you need to look like or your age, especially as a woman, like if you're past the age of, a, you know, 22, you're too old. If you don't have fake boobs or if you don't have an OnlyFans now, it's about the OnlyFans. If you don't have that, if you're not naked on uh, Instagram, there's a whole slew of things that it's not just like about being a funny comedian. It's about when you're a woman, it's like, are you a hot woman or are you, you know, like all these things? Well, I don't really know. It's not just about being PC. It's about this whole popularity structure that's going on right now. Right. And somebody could just talk about the most mundane thing and it, and you hear a 12 second clip of it. And because their tits are out, um, you know, it's not that it's like PC. It's just like it's acceptable. Like I don't know what how to explain it. It's like oh. a, the zeitgeist has shifted for sure. I uh, know. Uh, I as a general rule of thumb, I despise contests co for comedians. I'm just oh, I hate them. And but I was at one point I was told that you know if I wanted people to see me, you know, to go ahead and do the contest. And I was doing one in DC and made it through the first round. And there was another comedian, I won't mention her by name, 
she did her routine and she made it to the next round as well. The now what I was trying to do for the so for the next week, I did I wrote a whole new routine for the following week because I figured same audience, same judges, you know, I'm gonna show I wanted them to know that I was good at what I did. I didn't just have those seven minutes. I got you know, I can so I wrote a whole new seven minute bit for the next round. The this other comedian, she did the exact same set. She just did it with a shorter, tighter skirt and a shorter, tighter top. Mm-hmm. You know, so she did it with more cleavage. Her skirt barely covered. You know, I think what did I think she had her skirt tailored to her pubic hair. It's like I think it's like okay, my pubic hair stopped here, so let's lower the dress one inch below that, and it's because it was and and let make it tighter because I can still breathe. Tighter, tighter. Okay, there we go. And she cleaned up on the votes. Mm-hmm. You know, but it was the exact same routine. Mm-hmm. And the only thing she did was and make it tighter. And, and even my wife goes, "Oh my God, yeah, she's this. Look at that outfit." She goes, and I said to my wife, I said, yeah, she's going to clean up. <laughs> she's she's going to get every vote of every guy in here, you know, because of the way she's dressed. And her routine was the exact same routine as she did before. I did an entirely new routine, and it was a very funny routine. I, did, I, I made it that round, but even, or did I? I didn't make it to the finals. I made it to the quarterfinals, which is the. Semifinals. I'm into the semifinals, I think. Yeah, semifinals. But they brought in a, a ringer, a guy, a guy who was not part of the contest for the entire thing. He wasn't there. And they just brought him in like for this one round. And he brought like 20 or 30 people with him. Mm-hmm. He was a professional, I could tell. And he obviously won. But uh, the young lady, like I said, she did, she was not, she didn't do anything different. She just wore a tighter clothing and she cleaned up, you know, and mm-hmm. I, like I said, that kind of bothered me because I thought it was like a comedy contest, you know, because yeah. if I'd known, if I'd known it was a genitalia contest, I, I would have worn tight pants. Well, like, <laughs> I'll say this, like, and kind of to look at it from both sides, like I absolutely like, yes, you know, women's empowerment absolutely like wear what makes you feel empowered but i will say like in my years in comedy like that happens where people do that for those purposes um i'm not saying that she did um you know if that's something that made her feel awesome like go girl like work it but it does happen and like that is part of this whole thing and it's happening on line on tiktok on instagram things like that um everybody's comedy journey is different, but I am saying like as a woman in comedy and my experience is like, I'm in it for the work and the process and the jokes and the writing. And I know that I'm in it for the long process. And right now I feel like I'm in this valley because we go through these peaks and valleys where I don't know where I'm going. And it is a scary, lonely process. And when it comes to the culture right now, it is confusing because we're kind of trapped in this online system. And at the same time, we have to be there in person. So it, it's very interesting what we're watching right now. Yeah, no, I'm I'm all for the, uh, like I said, if it were a show, if she were doing a show, you know, not a contest, but her show, you know, and that's the way she wants to dress, I'm saying, fine. I'm not even saying what she wore was wrong. I'm just saying... The fact that the judges bought it is what annoys me. You know, it's a comedy contest, judges. You know, yeah. so th- that's what bothered me, not what she wore. I don't care. She could have, as far as I'm concerned, she could have performed stripped naked. You know, that's not going to me, that's not going to make her funnier or less funny, you know, because it, to me it's comedy. But then again, maybe I'm just defective. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't care what people look like or how they dress. If I, I want them to, to deliver on the promise of being whatever it is that their promises and if their promises like i'm not funny but i'm hot then be hot if their if their promises well i'm really really funny but i'm not much to look at but damn it if you just 
listen to what I'm doing, I'm hilarious. Then yeah, be hilarious. You know, that's all. I'm. I just. That's why I don't like contests. I just can't stand them. Yeah, don't do comedy contests, and people out there just don't do them. <laughs> do yeah. it for the story, but don't do them after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do one for you have the experience, and so you can talk about how crappy they are. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah I, I hate contests. Or bringer yeah. shows. Don't do bringer shows. Yeah, I, 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 I don't like bringer shows either. And I've, and well, I'm at the point now where it's like, Doug, I, I'm, I'm not, I can't fill this. I can't do a bringer show like you know, 15, 20 people because I think what happens is when you're a young person. Your friends are excited to see you on stage and they'll come out the first couple of times that you do like a bringer show. But then it's like, oh, you're gonna tell the same seven minutes? I'm not coming out for that. So after a while, the luster is gone. Now, which is why I don't usually do like the same seven minutes, but well, actually I, I never really did do the same seven minutes. That was the knock on me. I, I won't mention the bookers' names, but what there was one particular booker, booker who said to me, um, you know, I've seen you four times. I've never seen you do the same seven minutes twice. He goes, and you're funny. You're really funny. He goes, but I can't book you because I don't know if you have a good solid five minutes set. And I thought to myself, did, did, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> did, did, do you, did you hear what you just said? You see me. Four times I did seven minute different different sets. That's twenty eight minutes, and I was funny, but you don't know if I have a good five minutes. And and he wouldn't. He didn't book me for the longest time. I, he, he booked me once out of desperation, I think, or the, out of the sheer fact that it was starting to look back that he wouldn't book me, but he booked other people. But that was it. He booked me once, seven minutes. I nailed it. I did exactly what I wanted to do. I got the response responses from the audience. Said exactly what I wanted. And he never booked me again. But whenever he works with me, he makes sure he says degrading things to me or about me if he oh, can. Yeah. The yeah. politics of comedy, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm GD Fenderson, certified forensic humorist and host of Dunway Past Funny. Thank you for watching our continued interview with Christy Bellish, the headlining feminist. And please come back to watch more of our interview with Christy. And when you come back, Bring a friend.